What was the most uneven maritime commitment to history? What occurred and what was the outcome? It's late October 1940. There is a guard of 38 boats gathering in Halifax, Nova Scotia. They'll set out toward Liverpool, conveying a scope of cargoes which are crucial to the conflict exertion. Caravan HX-84 being collected. HX-84 leaves on the 28th of October with two Canadian destroyers as escorts and one helper cruiser, the HM. MS Jervis Bay. The weather conditions is ordinarily terrible for that season, yet in any case the escort proceeds across the downpours and enormous rushes of the North Atlantic. Following one day, both the destroyers advance back to Halifax, leaving the boats of HX-84 under the assurance of Jervis Bay. Yet, she isn't a warship. A helper cruiser was a sea liner with weapons darted to her decks. For this situation, seven six-inch firearms mounted in the open with no heavily clad turrets or casements to safeguard her groups. The boat is unarmored. It isn't especially quick either, yet at this phase of the conflict the Royal Navy is frantically shy of boats to accompany escorts, and there is barely any choice. HMS Jervis Bay prior that year. You can see the starboard firearms in this photograph. The simplest to recognize is only abaft from where the gunwale slants down from her bow. Following seven days adrift, in among November's obscuring evenings and cold oceans, the caravan is spotted by the German weighty cruiser Admiral Scheer. This boat is very much defensively Covered, has a fundamental radar for tracking down reach and six eleven weapons. Her class has been planned as business marauders and she's precisely exact thing the British apprehension. Caravans areas of strength for our submarines, however, are successfully sheep to the butcher where surface looters are involved. The Jervis Bay spots the Admiral Shear in the late evening off the shoreline of Iceland and promptly challenges her with a blaze from her sign lights. The captain of the Admiral Shear, be that as it may, knows not to answer. Rather, they stand by as long as they can drawing the caravan to them as close as could be expected. Chief of Naval Operations Shear, flaunting her bow turret with its pocket warship weapon. After tense minutes, the commander of the Jervis Bay requests them to fire. They are terribly outmatched. A few shots land close to the Admiral Shear, yet after a small bunch of salvos, the scaffold of the Jervis Bay is hit. She is burning from stem to harsh, battered by those eleven weapons, and sinking quick. The Jervis Bay battled for twenty-six minutes, sufficient time for the caravan to begin dispersing. Her commander got a Victoria Cross, however notwithstanding the mind-boggling dauntlessness of her group, the Admiral Shear was soon ready to direct its concentration toward the shipper boats of the guard. Among these boats was the SS Beaverford. She was equipped with two little firearms, one at the bow and one at the harsh. SS Beaverford, a tanker with 10,000 ton limit and 12 traveler lodges. Furthermore, two little firearms. The Admiral Shear sank the SS Maiden, then set the big hauler San Demetrio burning. She turned, sank SS Trullard quite expeditiously, and began terminating an SS Kenbane head. For escorts, this was the horrible situation. They could stay away from the solitary U-boats of the period, yet when a business plunderers was among them, they were ill-fated. Beaverford's skipper was Hugh Pettigrew, a 60-year-old Scot who had been a traitor sailor for the majority of his life, albeit seeing help in the Great War. Seeing the Kenbane head experience harsh criticism, he understood the game was up. He requested his group to happen and fire her three-bow pea shooter at the Admiral Shear as the late autumnal obscurity fell about them. The main shot landed shockingly near the German panzer skiff. At this point, Kenbane Head was sinking and the Admiral Shear turned its sights onto Beaverford. She shot star shells to illuminate the objective and Captain Pettigrew requested a turn to bring the harsh four firearm into play. He flagged the remainder of the caravan. It is our turn now. Goodbye, the skipper and team of SS Beaverford. This is a still from video shot by the Admiral Shear, it being hit to show Jervis Bay. There aren't any comparative pictures of Beaverford, sadly. Beaverford utilized her cutting edge motors to rapidly shift speed and heading, keeping away from the underlying shots from Admiral Shear. The escort was at this point 
point scattering into the obscuring unhappiness and laying a thick distraction as it went. Pettigrew might have run, yet rather drove his group through four hours of dashing all through this smoke, seeming to discharge its little firearms, then getting away from once again into cover. Each time she returned, she was hit. However, she didn't run. Naval Commander Shear terminated 71 5.9 adjust, landing 16 hits and 12 11 adjust, hitting multiple times. The little beaverford, stacked with aluminum, copper, food, ammo, and wood, gradually capitulated to breaks and harm, leaking water and illuminated in the murkiness by the flames consuming on the lumber on her deck. She was at this point an obvious objective. Commander Crank on the Admiral Shear requested his group to moderate ammo and finish the Beaverford with a torpedo. This struck her bow, exploding the ammo somewhere down in the hold, and the vessel blew separated. She sank with all hands, while the Jervis Bay had essentially had cruiser weapons. In the event that more seasoned plans and little to no security, the Beaverford was a legitimate freighter. Her possibility causing harm was negligibly little, while the huge German weapons could wreck her in genuinely short request. There are numerous such stories of gallantry from the Atlantic Guards, however this one truly stands apart for me. After the conflict, some uncertainty was projected on the points of interest of this story, notably the logbook of the German boat makes little notice of this experience. Whether this precisely mirrors what is going on, or the skipper was not excessively excited about a portion of the subtleties of how he figured out how to just sink five of the guard's boats, we don't have the foggiest idea. Positively, the story is less notable than the bravery of the team of the Jervis Bay. There were, notwithstanding, survivors to tell that story. Beaverford's four-hour fight against sad chances, be that as it may, appears to be a fitting response to me.